I'm going to begin now to imagine that you're with me in the study. How do I prepare my messages? And I will tell you now that the one thing you desperately need if you're going to be a preacher is time and time on your own. I used to reckon it took me an hour on my own in the study for five minutes in the pulpit. And I'm not a brief preacher. But that's the kind of time I reckoned I needed. And I gave it priority over anything else because I regard it as the most important thing I can do for my people. Feed them with the truth. So come with me into the study and uh, I will try and recreate a time of preparation. The first part I would call meditation. Just thinking, sitting and thinking. Sometimes I sit and think and sometimes I just sit. But just sitting isn't very fruitful. So having by my side my Bible, and there it is. Have you brought your Bible with you? Would you like to hold it like that with the back away from you? Is it dirty right across? If you hold your Bible and look at the edge of the pages, you'll find whether you're reading the whole Bible or just favorite bits. This Bible was falling to pieces when I was in Romania earlier this year. The pages were literally falling out. And a young man came up to me one morning and he said, would you give me your Bible, please? I said, what for? And he said, I want to do something with it. And off he went with this Bible. And he brought it back, rebound, all put together, and even transparent sticky tape on the pages that were torn. And I got my Bible back. I said, you couldn't have given me anything better than my old Bible back. Bibles are like shoes, like old slippers. You get so used to the old ones that new ones are horrible. And I hate to change my Bible and I thought the time has come. Literally the pages were dropping out when I read it to them in Romania. And he saw that and he was a bookbinder. And there it is, I've got it back. I hope it'll see me out now. But in the study, you've got a Bible, you've got a, a stack of clean white paper and a pen. And for the first part of preparation, you must not have anything else. That's all you need for the first part only. And what you do is you've got a passage to read and you read it and you read it, and you read it, and you read it. Even reading it aloud is helpful because you'll get more meaning out of it when you read it aloud, if you've got the right meaning, which you may not have. There's a man in Yorkshire reading and he read the words, we speak that we do know And uh, you realize what he was reading. We speak that we do know. Very different. The very way you read the word Emmanuel, God with us, tells you what, how you understand it. You can either say God with us, or God with us, or God with us. See, reading it aloud, you'll find yourself getting different meanings out of it. And at the same time as you're reading, 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 write down every thought that comes to you. Whatever it is, it may be crazy. It may be off-center. 
just keep writing down everything that comes to your mind as you read that passage. Everything. You'll finish up with half a dozen pages of the most scrappy notes you could imagine. But that's the beginning. Don't, whatever you do, read someone else's sermon at this stage because the temptation is to pinch it, if it's any good. I've got three tons of books at home. No, it's probably more now. But there's not a single volume of somebody else's sermons in my library. And though I enjoy listening to other people, I don't ever tempt myself to pinch their sermon. It's your own. You want to give your sermon. God wants you to be you, not imitating someone else. There are certain ways of speaking, even the word God. I can tell you what preacher someone's been listening to you by the way they say God. And if you're copying someone else, don't. God wants each of us to find our own way of doing it. Ne nevertheless, I'm just telling you how I do it, and you can ask the Lord whether you should try the same. But that's how I begin. I want it to be my sermon and nobody else's. I want to get the truth for myself, because if I get it for myself, I can get excited about it. And if I can move myself, I'm going to move other people. And uh, my wife will tell you that very often when I'm preparing, I get up off my seat and I just walk up and down, wear the carpet out, and I'm almost beginning to <laughs> preach to myself. And uh, if you get excited about a passage of the Bible, you can know that your people will get excited as well. If you're not, not excited, don't expect them to be. So begin with just paper, a pencil, and your Bible, and start writing down every single thing that comes to you. Let me say straight away, I should have said this at the beginning, it's like cooking a meal. Cooking takes far longer than eating. Preparing a good meal takes time, and though it may be consumed in 20 minutes, it may have taken a couple of hours to get ready. And you're feeding people with the Word of God. So time is very important. There's no shortcut. Meditating on God's Word is the first step. Now one thing you can do at this stage is to look at different translations of the Bible. My basic one is the New International, the NIV, the Nearly Infallible Version. But uh, I've got here the New Testament from 26 translations. 26 different translations all in one volume. And they've started doing the Old Testament too. I find that very helpful. Read all the different translations there have been. See if that brings other thoughts to your mind. A cross-reference Bible is helpful at this stage. That has text references down a center column or at the side to look up related passages to the one that you're looking at. And that can be useful too. Let me say a word about this. Chapter and verse numbers were not God's idea, and they're not inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were the work of an Archbishop of Canterbury called Stephen Langton in the 13th century who divided the Bible into chapters. And then along came a printer from Paris who had a long journey from Paris to Lyon by carriage and to while away the time, he divided the chapters into verses. Now both those developments have an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage, of course, is that it's much easier to look up the scripture. And uh, 
People often criticize me for not mentioning chapter and verse numbers. But I follow the apostles, they only mentioned the book. They said it's in Isaiah. And the people who heard the apostles had to go away and search the scriptures. Nowadays people just go and look them up. And it has made it convenient for cross-references and so on. The disadvantage is much bigger than the advantage. You can get the Bible now without chapter and verse numbers. Did I hear a hallelujah? hallelujah? My friend in America, Lagarde Smith, a legal professor, has produced the New International Version without chapter and verse numbers. Isn't that wonderful? Aren't you excited? <laughs> I thought you'd really want it. You can either get it hardback called the Narrated Bible or softback called the Daily Bible. That's much cheaper. And people who've got it tell me the Bible becomes a different book. They read it like they read any other book now. Instead of reading just little bits or a 10 verses a day keeps the devil away sort of thing, they read whole sections and they read whole books through and that's made a big difference to their Bible reading. So you can get it without chapter and verse numbers but for preparing they are useful. But personally my rule is rarely if ever do I quote chapter and verse. I will quote books. For example, did you know that God whistles? That's in Isaiah. And you say, where? Well, you read Isaiah. <laughs> you won't have to read too far, actually, but uh, he says twice, God whistles. So I'm so glad because I whistle too. Now then, that's phase one. I'm rushing through the preparation because after I've got all my thoughts down on paper, still I'm not going to look at other people's yet. I will do later, but my second stage is the most important for me, and that's to analyze the passage, to try and understand its structure, the shape of it. And I have spent lots of time analyzing scripture for its structure. Once I've got that structure, I've got the skeleton of my teaching. I then have to put flesh on it and clothes on it, but I need to get the skeleton first, the bones of a passage. And now I want you to turn to the paper I've got you. Look at the first page. And I'm just trying to think aloud for what I do with Psalm 23. My first way of structuring a passage is to do it in the language of the passage or my own language, but I don't try and do more than that. And the top half of this page contains my first analysis of the passage. I realize that chapter, uh, verse 1 is different from verses 2 to 6. Verses 2 to 6 are a description but verse 1 is the key to the whole psalm, for it's who he is. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Of course, the word want there is more, better translated now by lack. But that's the statement. And where the scripture says the Lord, we know that in Hebrew that's the Lord's name, Yahweh. Yahweh is my shepherd. It's saying the God of Israel is my shepherd. That particular God is the one who looks after me. So verse 1 stands on its own. So I've called that who he is. And it raises the question, who is your shepherd? Who are you expecting to look after you? It's saying there are many gods around many different names but it's saying there's one God who's my shepherd 
and it's the God of, who's revealed himself in Israel. Verses 2 to 6 are obviously how he cares for me. And we notice again a change of the pronouns in verses 2 to 3. The pronoun is he. Verses 4 to 5, you. And verse 6, me. So there's a change of focus there through the verses. Again, if you know the, the psalm, you've probably noticed all this. So I've got my two main subjects, who he is and how he cares. And then I've divided the second half into three sections under he, you and me. Now what does he do? And I've written down there are four things that the psalmist says he will do. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me by still waters, restores my soul or literally my life and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Each of those phrases is so meaningful. In the Middle East there are no green fields. There are patches of green grass in the desert and the shepherd must know where they are and he will lead his sheep to the green pasture and when the sun is at the height of its power in the midday, he literally takes a piece of string and he ties the four legs of the sheep together and pushes them over. I've got photographs of that at home. He makes me lie down and it's a very powerful expression. And the psalmist is saying, that's how I feel sometimes. He's pushed me flat on my back. He's made me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. Did you know that a sheep's nostrils are next door to its mouth? And therefore it can't drink rough water. Or the water goes up its nostrils and it drowns. So a sheep has to have still water. And he the shepherd will know where the still water is that the sheep can drink and he will lead them by still water, rough water no good. He restores my life when I'm exhausted, when I'm sheep very quickly get tired especially when you have to go miles to find food or drink and you can't just be turned into a field. And the good shepherd knows when the sheep need to be restored, rested. And he leads me in the right paths for his name's sake. The whole point of that whole section is for his name's sake, for his reputation. The shepherd is doing it not so much for us as for himself and his reputation as a good shepherd. And he does all that for us for his name's sake because every sheep bears the name of the shepherd and sheep reflect how well they've been looked after. You go to a sheep market and watch the farmers looking at the sheep they're going to buy and they know who's been a good shepherd. It's for the shepherd's name's sake. Then in verses four to five, it's much more personal, you. And he's talking about what he does, what the shepherd does for him. That he is without fear in the valley of deep shadow. This is not the valley of death. I know this psalm is a favorite at funerals. It's nothing to do with death. It's going through a valley where there are shadows, where there are caves, where there are hollows in the rock where wild animals crouch and wait for the sheep to come. And this sheep says, I'm not afraid of evil because you're with me. You've given me courage. His rod and his staff comfort. The rod is a sort of cudgel, a short piece of wood with a big knob at the end. And the shepherd will use that, not on the sheep, but on the wild animal. 
but he will also have a crook which he puts around the neck of the sheep and pulls it away from the wild animal. And David is speaking about his experience as a shepherd here when he had to use the cudgel, the rod on the bear, on the lion, they were crouching in the shadows. And we go through the valley of shadows all through life. It's not the end of life here. That comes later. But in the middle of life, we are going through a valley where we are under threat, where there are evil forces waiting to attack. And with the shepherd, we don't fear that. He's big enough to deal with them prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. I mean, the picture there is a man sitting down to a big meal and all his foes are around him. I mean, it's a lovely picture. It's a humorous picture. And he's tucking into his meal and he's got a good meal and he doesn't care about all his enemies around. And you anoint my head with oil Sheep's heads are very vulnerable. There's no wool on them. And they often have wounds on their heads from all kinds of things that they rub into or run up against. And I've seen shepherds soothing wounds on sheep's heads. I've been a shepherd, actually. My first job on the farm was sewing lamb's eyelids open. Many lambs are born with dropped eyelids and therefore they're going to be blind. And you take a needle and thread and you sew the eyelid to the eyebrow and sew it open. And after a bit, the muscles of the eyelids will take over and the thread will rot and drop out. But that was my first job as a shepherd and with these poor little lambs and me with a needle and thread trying to sew their eyes open. But caring for sheep teaches you an awful lot about the Lord. And then finally, he looks to the future, his future, me. I like to talk about the shepherd's sheepdogs, two of them, goodness and mercy. And the two sheepdogs will follow me all the days of my life and then dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a lovely psalm. Well, now what we've done, we've, we've looked at the structure of it. And the structure has given us two main headings and then three smaller headings and then further under the first, he, four little headings. I call this the A1A1 method. Big A, big one, little a, little one. And use that to find the structure of a passage. Once you've opened that up, you've got the bones on which you're going to build your sermon. I've already started building it, but... But then I like to put it in a more easily mem uh, remembered form. We've got the structure. But one of the ways to make it more memorable is called alliteration. Now, I know all the things against and for this, but I've found it helpful to me. It's a much easier structure to remember when it rhymes. And so I tend then to take the structure that I've written at the top of that paper and put it into alliterative form. And so I've changed the main headings to the shepherd looked to and the sheep looked after because those are the two themes of the psalm. And under the sheep looked after, I've got the provision the shepherd makes for them, the protection he offers them and the prospect for the future he offers. So that's just neatly turned the structure into an alliterative structure. And I've even on this managed to take it even further into the smaller headings. Restful pastures, refreshing pools, restoring periods and right paths. 
and the protection that he gives us courage, comfort, confidence and consecration. And the prospect right through life and long after death. And I've even managed to take those two a little further and label them goodness and mercy and in his house forever. So there we've got an outline. Now that's all it is. But it's a much more easily remembered outline than the first one. Do you follow me? Easier for me to remember and easier for people to remember as well. You see, alliteration has been called the province of fools, poets, and Plymouth brethren. <laughs> well, now, I'm not a Plymouth brother, and I hope I'm not a fool, but I am a wee bit of a poet, and I like poetry. And most of the Bible is in poetry, not prose. The New International Version shows you that by the layout of its print. And there's prose, just looks like a newspaper column. And there's poetry. And you notice that the poetic parts have gaps between each line. The prose goes straight through. Most of the Bible is poetry. And that's for a number of reasons, but you tend to remember poetry much better than prose. The boy stood on the burning deck, when all but he had fled. How many remember that? And that's so easily we remember poetry. And therefore poetic heading help. Now, there are two things needed here. One is a rhyming dictionary. Did you know there was such a thing? tells you all the words that rhyme in their beginning and all the words that rhyme at the end. And you just look at one year word and you've got all the rest. That's a great help to get an outline like that. And the other help is uh, a thes thesaurus that gives you words that mean the same thing. And the easiest I've found is this one, the Reader's Digest Family Word Finder but you can get a thesaurus very easily. And uh, therefore you look up the word you want, you want to match, and it gives you seven or eight words that mean the same thing, and you can choose one that fits. So I'm afraid I'd do that. The classic case of alliteration is a sermon on the prodigal son. The three main headings are his his madness, his sadness, and his gladness. And under his madness, he caviled, he traveled, he reveled. Under his sadness, he went to the dogs, he ate with the hogs, and he lost his togs. <laughs> and under his gladness, he got the seal, he danced the reel, he ate the veal. <laughs> now that's a terrible outline. But look, I could, I, I remember that so easily. It just fits. So the disadvantage is when you're stuck for the last word and you really try and force a word in to fit. But most of the Bible is in poetry. God must be a poet because he speaks in poetry so often. All the prophecies are in poetry, or most of them. And it's so that people can remember it easily. And uh, so I'm not ashamed to use alliteration for my outlines. Let's move on to one that's more complicated. Turn over the page to an outline of 1 Corinthians 13. What I'm trying to impress on you is that time spent on analyzing the structure of a passage pays off enormously. And I would always spend a lot of time on this phase, really seeing the structure, how it builds up. It tells you things about the passage you never saw, never thought about maybe. Well, you know the passage very well, 1 Corinthians 13. 
And he, here is the outline that I developed before I preached the, the chapter. There are clearly three parts to the chapter, which in most Bibles have been divided into three paragraphs. And the first three verses are clearly about the necessity of love. That without love you can do nothing, you can be nothing. Nothing is a strong word. But without love it's all wasted. So one to three, I give the title, The Necessity of Love. Four to seven, talk about the quality of love. Notice that I'm using the end of the words to rhyme, necessity, quality of love. And verses 8 to 13 are clearly about the superiority of love, that it's greater than everything else. So we've got our main headings. So let's now analyze each of the sections into further detail using our A1A1 method. Verses 1 to 3 divide into two clear parts. Verses 1 to 2 are about the gifts that God gives us. Verse 3 is about the gifts we give to others. Verses 1 to 2, the theme is, if I have gifts from God, but haven't loved, I am nothing. Verse 3 is, if I give, I gain nothing. So there's a clear parallel here between gifts that I've received from God and gifts that I give to other people. In the first case, I am nothing. In the second case, I gain nothing. Let's look at the gifts in more detail. He mentions three. Gift of tongues, gift of prophecy, gift of faith. These are all spiritual charismata given by the Holy Spirit to us. But even if I have all three and lack love, then I am nothing. Just a big noise. Tongues, they can be tongues of men or of angels, but even if I speak them all and lack love, I'm nothing. Prophecy, I may fathom all mysteries and knowledge and be able to prophesy and tell people everything they want to know, but I'm nothing. Faith to move mountains. I've not got so much faith. Jesus said, if you have faith as big as a mustard seed, you can tell a mountain to jump in the sea and it'll go. I won't ask you to put your hand up if you've tried that. But I know some people in Japan who did. There was an orphanage in Japan which was six stories high and bounded on three sides by a public street and it was run by the Japan Evangelistic Band, J-E-B. And they were full of orphans, which they'd either found on the streets or been given. And they had too many orphans in the house. And they, the missionaries discussed the situation. They said, well, we can't build any further up because we're in an earthquake zone and six stories is the maximum. We can't build out on the street that side or this side or the front. At the back was a very steep hill right up against the building. And one of the missionaries joked and said, of course, if we had faith, we'd tell the mountain at the back of the orphanage to jump in the sea. And the other missionaries laughed at the joke. But one or two of the children heard that and took it seriously. And they went to the Lord and they said, Lord, please, will you throw that mountain in the sea so that we can have more orphans in the orphanage? They went away on their annual holiday and when they came back, the hill had gone. 
and it was level ground. The missionaries were astonished, but the children weren't. They just said, but we asked Jesus to throw it in the sea. The missionaries were not content with that answer and they made inquiries as to what had happened while they'd been away. And apparently it was a large seaport town and the council had decided to fill in the sea to make more ground to build more warehouses for the ships. And they'd wondered where they could get enough dirt to throw in the water. And the councillor had suggested, what about that hill behind the orphanage? And so for a week while they'd been away, earth-moving plants moved in and took that soil and threw the whole thing in the sea to make more ground for the ships. Well, I'll share that story. I've got a photograph of the building at home. It challenged my faith. Children sometimes have a much stronger faith than adults. We are too sophisticated, we have objections, we have questions. But even if you had faith to tell a mountain jump, jump in the sea and you don't have love with it, you're nothing. That's a very strong statement, nothing. Not even a little, you're nothing. And what about what I give to other people? Well, I could give all my possessions to feed the poor. And in the world's eyes, that'd be great. But without love in it, I would gain nothing. They would gain a lot, but I would gain nothing. I could even become a martyr and give my life to be burned at the stake. And still, if I'm lacking in love, I gain nothing. Well, that's the necessity of love. It's absolutely necessary. If you're going to be anything or gain anything, without love, you are nothing and you gain nothing. Now, the middle section of the chapter is the one that's read at weddings. I don't know why, because the love you're celebrating at a wedding has nothing to do with this. You're celebrating Eros, or at best, um, Filio. But this is agape here. Now, every marriage needs agape, but very few have it. So that's a good reason to read it. I usually read the Song of Solomon at a wedding, that's much more appropriate. But this, Paul isn't thinking of weddings at all here. He's thinking of normal church life. And when you analyze that middle section, I know you could recite it, but when you analyze it, a strange thing emerges. First of all, if you look at the right-hand side, it's a sandwich. He begins on a positive note and tells us what love is. He then moves on to a negative note and tells us what it isn't and what it doesn't. And then it goes back to the positive again as to what it does. So there are two sides to love, what it is and what it does. And both are necessary. And we need to understand what agape is and what it does to get the picture. But to get the clearest picture, you need to know what it isn't and what it doesn't. You see, a preacher has to define things in two ways, positively and negatively. We are to teach the truth and we're to teach what is error. We're to teach what is right and what is wrong. And sometimes, you can define a thing negatively much more clearly than positively. And there's more negative here than positive. Start with the positive. And we notice that the positive sections are concerned with other people. The negative sections are concerned with yourself. Love is right when it's thinking of others and wrong when it's thinking of itself. Do you follow me? So the negative and the positive make up this full picture. 
So we begin with what it is towards others. It is patient and kind. Lovely words. Patient, kind. Then we move on to the negative. What it doesn't, and here we're concerned with self now, it doesn't envy other people and it doesn't boast. It doesn't either feel, why don't I have that? Nor does it feel, I have that and you don't. Again, there's a very clear definition here of what it doesn't do. Then we come to the central one, what it isn't. Love isn't proud. It isn't rude. It isn't self-seeking. It isn't easily angered. Now, defining it negatively like that challenges the reader of it to say, where do I fit in all this? Does this describe me or someone else? Then he moves back again to what it doesn't. And you notice that even in the negative section, there's a sandwich between doesn't, isn't, and doesn't. Very careful structure here. And once you've seen the structure of a passage, you understand how the writer of it is thinking. It's a very orderly chapter. Then he goes back to what it doesn't. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs done to it. And it doesn't delight in evil. And then he goes back to the positive again. What it does do, it rejoices with the truth. It always protects others. It always trusts others. It always hopes for the best. And it always perseveres, even when it's disappointed. Now, do you realize that in the positive side, all the way through, he's describing Jesus? Every positive thing he says about love, you could say about Jesus himself. The negative things, he's talking about us. And we are really challenged. Is there any trace of this negative in me? So much for the middle section. But you see again, we've found the skeleton of the passage. We've found the shape of it. And this positive, negative, positive, the right-hand side, and then the more detailed what it is at the beginning and what it does at the end, and in between what it doesn't, what it isn't, and what it doesn't. Very, very careful, systematic description of love. Dare I ask, how many of you had seen all that in that chapter? Anybody? Well, you see what I mean. You've now seen a shape to this passage which will color your thinking from now on and make it much easier for you to teach it to other people because you'll remember the structure and that will be the skeleton of your teaching. The final part of the chapter is clearly about the superiority of love. And therefore it is first of all con contrasted with temporary things. And he goes back to prophecy, tongues and knowledge. And he says all these things will pass away. They are only here for a time. They're like the scaffolding of a building which is removed when the building is finished. Once the church is built, this can come down. So the key words there are pass away. Then he uses a different approach by highlighting the change between now and then. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Actually, the word is now we see in a mirror darkly. But in those days, they didn't have silver mirrors like we have. They had polished copper mirrors. 
and you could see through them darkly. You couldn't get a clear image with them. But then we shall not need a mirror, we'll see face to face. We only see God now in a mirror. We see him in the faces of saints. We see him in the beauty of the trees. But it's all a reflection and it's not a clear view. You can look at nature, you can look at human nature and see a reflection of God's image, but that's all you can see. One day you will see God face to face. Now, then, now you're like a little child. One day you'll mature and you'll put away childish toys. Of course, a Roman boy did that at a specific age when he literally threw away his toys, became a man. I wish we had such a ceremony in our society when a boy becomes a man. Some men are still boys and the only difference is the price of their toys. <laughs> but you see, the Jews have the bar mitzvah and when a Jewish boy reaches that age, he puts away all his childish things and he becomes a man. And Paul says that's how it's going to be with us. We'll put away the toys. He's saying charismatic gifts are toys. Of course, they're tools as well to build up, but they'll all go. I was once preaching to 200 doctors and I said to them, in heaven, you'll all be out of a job. And one doctor shouted back and so will you, David. <laughs> which put me in my place thoroughly. <laughs> but yes, we'll have different jobs up there. Put away childish things. And now he reaches the great verse. He says, now faith, hope and love last. They are permanent. Prophecy, tongues and knowledge, temporary. But faith, hope and love, permanent. They will survive all the time. And even among the, them, love is greater than faith and hope. Because love is the nature of God. We never say God is faith or God is hope. We do say God is love. And that's the greatest thing of all. To be restored to the image of God and that means to be love. So, again, do you see that working on the structure of a passage has really revealed more to us of what it's all about and where it's going and how it was made up. I don't know if Paul thought his way to this or whether it just came naturally to him, but there is an order in almost every passage of Scripture which opens it up to you.